microorganism was not available or not coined by that time. So later on, and nobody believed him when he said there are some there is life and something is moving very small. Later, it was mainly because of the classical work done by the French scientist Louis Pasteur in 1860s. People realized there are certain organisms called as microorganisms. What he did was we know that in France, uh, wine is a very important drink and. So for the preparation of wine, the grape juice has to undergo fermentation. So what he showed for the first time, there are certain minute organisms and he coined the word microorganisms. Certain microorganisms convert grape juice to wine. So, and uh, people were really astonished by this discovery. Later, he added on one more thing to that. That means lot of silk, is again, silk is a very important industry in France. And he found that silk worms died. And he showed for the first time that the death of silk worm is due to a microorganism. Okay, so two important findings. One is the fermentation of wine. Other one is the death of silk worm is due to an organism. So that brought microorganisms into limelight. And people now, we know now uh, that microorganisms are present everywhere. They are present in the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we take, they are present in our body. The estimate is that each one of us carry more than one kilo of microorganisms in our body. Okay. So there are 80% of biological systems on earth. 80% here, when we say biological system, it includes plants, animals, and microbes. So 80% of this biological system is made up of microorganisms. So earlier, scientists who were working with microorganisms projected them as disease-causing organisms or those which cause, cause spoilage of food, textiles, wood, etc. So people were under the impression that microorganisms are harmful creatures. But later, the beneficial aspects of microorganisms were understood. And now we know that the beneficial aspects of microorganisms are much more compared to the harmful effects. So what I am going to cover in this lecture is the beneficial aspects of microorganisms. We'll see in different uh, varieties how they are helpful to humankind. So let us take agriculture first. How microorganisms are helpful in agriculture. At the time of independence, we know that there was shortage of food in our country. The food production, uh, the grain food grain production was only 50 million tons. So people had to live from ship to mouth existence. What we mean by this, people were waiting for the ship from US to come to India, carrying wheat. So people were very eagerly waiting for the ship to come so that they can get the wheat, they can grind it, make the wheat flour, make chapati out of it and eat. So that was the situation at the time of independence. That is why we call it as ship to mouth existence. And later on, we know that green revolution came into the picture. So high yielding varieties of crop plants were introduced. And with this, what happened to the food production? It almost doubled in 1970s, okay? Almost doubled. It became 108 million tons. So later in 1996, it further increased to 200 million tons, again further doubling. So now we have enough food to eat. So we are not worried about the food product availability in our country now. But after several decades, now we are realizing that for the production of high yielding varieties of crop plants, we have to use heavy doses of fertilizers and pesticides. And people were very happy to use the heavy doses because they were interested in getting more food. But now we know that they have spoiled the environment. So the present concern is how we, 
how we can overcome this spoilage of the environment. So we know that nitrate in the groundwater in many places is very much beyond the toxic level for human consumption. And the pesticides have been reported in breast milk and also in the tender coconut water, what we drink. So people are now concerned about the environmental pollution. And so the concept of organic farming came into the picture. And so it is not, not only in India, but all over the world, people are concerned about sustainable agriculture. So what is advocated in sustainable agriculture? Use less chemicals and more organics. When we say more organics, it includes compost, green manure, bio, biofertilizers, biocontrol agents, and so on. So let us talk of how microorganisms are useful as biofertilizers, which can supply nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. We know that they are, these are the three major plant nutrients. How can we avoid using chemical fertilizers or reduce application of chemical fertilizers and use these microorganisms which can supply nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium for plant growth? Let us take nitrogen first. And we know that nitrogen is present plenty in the atmosphere. Nearly 78% of the atmosphere is made up of nitrogen. But plants cannot directly use this nitrogen. But there are certain microbes in soil which can fix this atmospheric nitrogen and make it available for plant growth. All of us are familiar with leguminous plants which harbor root nodules. And what is present inside the nodule are the bacteria. And all of us know that they are rhizobia. But we have to go one step further and say it's just not rhizobium. There are several other genera closely related to rhizobium. So we know that cyanorhizobium, allorhizobium, badirhizobium, visorhizobium are other genera of other genera closely related to rhizobium, which form nodules in the roots of legumes and fix atmospheric nitrogen and make it available for plant growth. But see the other genera which I have listed here, phylobacterium, methylobacterium, acromobactrum, but cold area, cupria vidus, divosia. These bacteria also form nodules in the roots of leguminous plants. But all these reports have come from other countries. We do not have one report from India about these other organisms forming nodules in the leguminous plants. So there is ample scope for the young teachers here to look for these newer bacteria and see whether they are present in Indian soil and whether they can form nodules in leguminous plants. And we know that rhizobia lives in symbiosis with the legumes and they fix atmospheric nitrogen. There are reports they can fix up to 100 kg of nitrogen per hectare per season. And suppose you are interested in isolating a particular rhizobia, say your crop your, your legume of interest is groundnut and you want to select the best rhizobium which you can use for inoculating groundnut. How do we go about and do it? So what we do is we go to a groundnut field and we in, in nature naturally we can see few plants here and there in the field are more robust and they are growing more vigorously. So we presume that probably that is because of the best rhizobium they harbor in the root nodule. So we bring those nodules to the microbiology lab. We isolate the bacteria and then maintain them. Let us say we have isolated about 200 such rhizobia from the root nodules of groundnut. And what, you have, what is your main object is to, ice, to select the best rhizobium for inoculating groundnut. So that means from 200, we have to select the best one. How do we do it? So we have to shortlist the bacteria. So what we do is first, just to show here, a root nodule of a legume containing the pink, nice nodules and more the pink in color, we presume that it is a better nitrogen fixer. That is the pink color is because of a particular pigment called leg hemoglobin. 
both the nick hemoglobin it is a better nitrogen fixer so i was telling that you want to shortlist this from the 200 rhizobia you want to shortlist and select the best one so what we do we do the plant test tube assay in the laboratory so we grow a particular legume called a siratro which is a model test legume and then inoculate with these 20, 200 different rhizobia and then we can see from 200 maybe 50 of them are doing well compared to other 150 so we discard rhizobia select only those 50 rhizobia take it for the next test what we do next test is done in a glass house so this is called the leonard jar assembly assay so what is what we do is we take a horlix bottle at the bottom and we the, the bottle is above is a bare bottle the bottom of the bare bottle is cut and then we invert it and place it in the horlix bottle and the bare bottle we cover it with either sterilized sand vermiculite or any substrate so that it supports plant growth and we put a wick cotton wick and then then cotton wick extends up to the horlicks bottle and in the horlicks bottle we put a nutrient solution so the wick takes the nutrient solution and supplies to the plant and in the horlicks bottle he, i'm sorry in the beer bottle in the substrate we grow the test plant so this is a very simple method. It is called a Leonard jar assembly. We named after the person who recommended this method. And from 50, we can buy this assembly. We know which ones are doing good. So let us say we, we are bringing it down to 10. Okay. So from 200, we have brought it to 50. From 50, we are brought, bringing down to 10 through Leonard jar assembly. What is done next? Then we do go for the micro plot assays. So the, when we say micro plot, it is a small area, maybe two feet, two meters by two meters, and two meters by two meters. It will be collected for right. Two meters by two meters, and then we test all these ten rhizobia. And when we test these ten rhizobia, then maybe five of them are doing well. So we shortlisted now from 10 to 5. So these five bacteria, rhizobia, which we have shortlisted, goes for the large scale field evaluation. So we have a program, All India Coordinated Research Programs, AACRP. So they will be happy to help you out doing this trial all over the country which has different agroecological zones, different soil types, and then they will test it under five different locations and then find out which bacterium works in most of the agroecological zones. So that is what is released as the best rhizobium for inoculating groundnut. So these are the field experiment that has been done. You can see the difference between the uninoculated soya bean and the inoculated soya bean uh, with the selected best uh, rhizobium. And, and this is one of the experiment which we did uh, re fairly recently. This was done in, um, um, what is that? Kunur, not Kunur. Uh, near Gunt, uh, Pal it is not done in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, Karnul. It was done in Karnul. Uh, sorry, I forgot the name of the place. It was done in Karnul. And you can see the difference between uninoculated and the inoculated plants. This was a DST funded project. And uh, so we were really surprised to see the poor rhizobia in those soils. And you can see the difference between the uninoculated and the inoculated. Now, those people are very, very happy to use the rhizobium inoculation in their fields. And this is a slide where I have taken. Uh, this is based on the reports which came from the scientists working in different parts of our country on various leguminous crops. So in case of chickpea, that is Bengal gram, the yield increase from 5 to 20% has been reported, depending on the location, soil type, and so on. In case of cowpea, 10 to 15%. In case of red gram, that is pigeon pea, up to 30%. In case of mung bean, the green gram, up to 25%. And in urit bean, that is a black gram, up to 25% has been reported. 
and some rhizobia not only forms nodules in the root, they also form nodules in the stem. So these are referred to as stem nodule bacteria. Just to give one example, I'll give you the example of a green manure plant, Susbania rostrata, which is commonly grown by the farmers in Tamil Nadu. Before taking up the rice crop, they grow this green manure and then just puddle it into the soil, then transplant the rice. Uh, so this particular green manure plant forms nodules not only in the root but also in the stem and the bacterium has been identified as azorhizobium colinodens. So this adds a lot of nitrogen in addition to organic matter also to the soil thereby reduces the application of nitrogenous fertilizer. This is Suspenia rostrata. You can see some of the and the arrow so where you can see the nodules. This is the closer where you can see the stem nodule formed by azorhizobium. Another uh, <clears throat> plant which also forms uh, big root nodules is the cashurina, which is very commonly grown uh, very in the, by the side of rivers, uh, they sometimes near the, near the seashore and so on. And this cashurina forms root nodules and the organism that forms a nodule is not a rhizobium, but it is an actinomycete now called as actinobacteria called Frankia species. And the nodules are quite big in size, can be as big as the as size of a table tennis ball. So if some of you have the chance to see a cashewina plant, try to see, dig in the soil and see its big nodules, which are nitrogen fixing. And one of the experiments done by one of my students showed that increased inoculation of Frankia to Cacharina seedlings significantly increases the plant biomass. The what, I, what we expressed so far is the symbiotic nitrogen fixation. That means the bacteria enters the plant root and forms a nodule and form and fixes atmospheric nitrogen. So it forms a nodule and fixes atmospheric nitrogen. The second category of nitrogen fixation is called associative nitrogen fixation or associative symbiotic nitrogen fixation. Classical example under this is azospirillum. Azospirillum, uh, this bacterium, lot of work has been done in our country in this particular organism. The bacterium enters the epidermis. Sometimes it can go to the outermost cortical region sit there and fix atmospheric nitrogen. And another bacterium, which is also an associative nitrogen fixer, is gluconoacetobacter diazotrophicus. It is a sugar-loving bacterium. That's why it's called a saccharophilic bacterium. And as the name itself indicates, you can guess which type of plants they will be associated, sugar-loving bacteria. So it is associated with plants like sugar cane, sweet potato, sweet sorghum, and so on. And these are the associative symbiotic nitrogen fixing organisms. I have just included one table here about the work done in our country on azospirillum. You see increase in amaranthus is up to 36%. In coffee seedlings, up to 50% increase has been reported. Coming to the third category of nitrogen fixing organisms, they are free living nitrogen fixing organisms. That means these bacteria do not enter the plant root. They colonize only the rhizosphere. Rhizosphere is the region of the soil closely adherent to the plant root. So they colonize the rhizosphere and fix atmospheric nitrogen. And in addition to nitrogen fixation, they also produce growth promoting substances and other beneficial effects. So I've just included one table. Again, a lot of work has been done in our country on Astrobacter. In cabbage, up to 19% increase, tomato 28%, in onion 22% up to increase, and in brinjal up to 42% increase has been reported. So another group of free living nitrogen fixing bacteria or the cyanobacteria earlier called as blue-green algae. All of us are very familiar with Nostra, Cannabina, Tolipothrix, which are all photoautotrophic organisms. And they produce certain structures called as heterosis. And this is heterosis is the site of nitrogen fixation. 
the this back the cyanobacteria are easy to multiply the farmer himself can multiply this cyanobacteria he can make a trench of about what is recommended is 20 meters long 1 meter wide and about 22 centimeters depth and it can be lined with a polythene sheet and we and add water some sprinkle some soil and then inoculate with the starter culture of the cyanobacterium and it multiplies very fast in 15 days it forms a very thick layer and then in, one, in such one plot we can get 10 kg of the inoculum multiplied in such a short period so one can add, collect this and inoculate to the rice crop soon after transplanting rice or we can dry it and then also use it as a dry inoculum so again, a lot of work has been done on cyanobacteria in our country. I've just included one slide here where 17% increase in rice yield has been reported. And, and this is the, and, and we can see the heterocyst, which forms, fixes atmosphere, site of nitrogen fixation. And here is a slide when I visited a Kanyakumari district in Tamil Nadu, I could see a farmer raising the blue green algae. So you can see how he has just made a trench, put a polythene sheet, raises the, uh, it's now covered with the alga and he will add it soon after transplanting rice. And another interesting thing, what he told us, <clears throat> he, they also use it for feeding cattle, thereby it increases the milk yield. And another uh, organism, uh, water fern is azola. And this water fern azola harbors the cyanobacterium anabina azolae in the leaf. And this also can be multiplied very fast, just like blue green algae by the farmer in the, in the, in the field. And, and it multiplies very, very fast. In three weeks, it multiplies really hundred folds. Imagine hundred folds increase in three weeks time. And this can be used for inoculating the rice field before transplanting the rice or after transplanting. Some farmers transplant rice and then introduce azola. And again, it, it has been, it adds a lot of organic matter in addition to providing uh, nitrogen. So this just included a picture of uh, azola here, a single thing and a colony here. And here again, azola is as is farmers in Tamil Nadu, they use it not only for feeding the chicks, also for goat and also for uh, cows. And they say that it increases the weight of chicks and increases the milk yield in and of cows. Coming to the next major plant nutrient that is phosphorus. And we know that tropical soils are deficient in phosphorus. And most of our soils, we are in the tropical region. And when we are deficient, not only our soils are deficient in phosphorus, when a farmer adds phosphatic fertilizer, nearly 75 to 80% of the phosphorus is converted to a form which is not available for plant growth. So in acidic soils, it is converted to iron and aluminum phosphate. And in uh, slightly alkaline soils or saline soils, it is converted to calcium phosphate which is not available for plant growth. But there are many phosphate solubilizing microorganisms, bacteria as well as fungi, like Bacillus polymyxa, Pseudomonas striata, Aspergillus avomori, Penicillium digitatum. And these act on this unavailable form of phosphorus through the production of organic acids and then convert the unavailable form to available form. And the, the plant takes phosphorus in the form of H2PO4 ions. So these H2PO4 ions are released by the activity of these organisms. And again, in our country, there's plenty of rock phosphate, which is much cheaper compared to the fertilizer phosphorus. And this rock phosphate, the farmer can use this rock phosphate along with the phosphate, so phosphate solubilizing organism and he can give, get the same amount of yield as if he is using a sulfur uh, so phosphate solubilizing so phosphate so back to fertilizer. I just included the petri dish here, how we screen in the lab for phosphorus solubilization. Higher the solubilization, zone of solubilization, that means it's a better P solubilizer. 
and we will select such bacteria which produces the zone, bigger zone. And I've just included a slide of one phosphate solubilizing bacterium and one fungus. <clears throat> and one slide here shows the effect of phosphate solubilizing organisms used in various crops. See the percent increase in crop yield, 56% increase in cabbage, tomato 37% and cucumber 43%. Arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi also helps in phosphorus um, uptake, but I will not touch this because my next lecture in, is on arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And so we go to the next uh, nutrient, potassium. So potassium, comparatively less work on potassium mobilizing microorganisms compared to nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, they report the first report in our country came from Odisha, and the bacterium was named as Fruturia orangea, and it was isolated from banana rhizosphere. Later on, other organisms have been, it, other reports have come like Bacillus cereus, Klebsiella varicola, Bacillus mucilaginosus. All these are potassium mobilizing organisms. And here again, they produce organic acids, act on potassium and releases the ion which the plants can take. And compared to nitrogen and phosphorus, less number of studies have been done on this group of organisms. But what has come out of these studies that the, far, the farmer can reduce nearly 50% of potassium fertilizer through inoculation with potassium mobilizing bacterium and also in yield increase up to 20% has been reported. Coming to the next group of organisms which are helpful for plant growth are the plant growth promoting rhizomicroorganisms. And they improve plant growth by two methods. They, by the production of phytohormones like endolastic acid, cytokinins, gibberellins, and thereby promote plant growth or by suppressing the plant pathogens. So this is either the production of phytohormones, we call it direct mechanism, by suppression of plant pathogens, we call it indirect mechanism. So this is the method by which they promote plant growth. So a lot of work has been done globally on Pseudomonas fluorescence. If we just see, scan the literature on PGPR, you will invariably come across Pseudomonas fluorescence. The organism which has been worked next to Pseudomonas fluorescence is Burkholderia cepacea. And this is not only globally, including India. A lot of work has been done on Pseudomonas fluorescence. But look at the other organisms like Methylobacterium species, Azomarca species, Pantia, Penibisla species. Very little work has been done on these groups of organisms. We should thank the group in Madurai, the Tamil Nadu Agricultural University group, where they have initiated the work on Methylobacterium. A lot of work has been done on Methylobacterium. And whereas the other organisms like Azoarchus, Pantia, Penibisla species, very, very little work has been done in our country. So we had a project funded by DST. It was a women scientist project given to one other scientist. She worked in Pantnagar Agricultural University, then came to my lab uh, with the DST women scientist under the DST women scientist program. And she opted to work on these newer PGPRs. And the crop in which we, uh, we, were, we worked with was French bean, the vegetable French bean. And she screened various PGPRs. And what came out of this screening was that Pantia agglomerans proved to be the best PGPR, increasing the fresh weight as well as the total plant dry biomass. And she took this from the lab to the glass house. From the glass house, she took it to the field finally ended up in, in, ending was in the farmer's field and beautiful difference we could get in French bean because of inoculation with Pantia agglomerans. Now, French bean is grown in plenty around Bangalore and this is a practice which is followed by the French bean growers. And another student who completed his PhD also in my lab recently and he worked on chili, PGPR of chili and in this particular case, you know, the organism that was selected as the best was Bacillus lichniformis. And um, 
So this again, you can see he has taken it from, from the lab to glass house, finally ended up with the, uh, the farmer's field and significant difference in fruit yield, biomass, nutrient uptake, etc., was shown. And another area where we where the microbiology can be useful to the farming community is the organic matter decomposition. And we have just had uh, the Karnataka Pollution Control Board had a problem with the sugar factory and uh, <laughs> sugar factory waste. And then they came and then said whether we can use something which can reduce, take the time to uh, ferment or sorry, the decompose the windrows, the beggars in the windrows. So this is how the windrows are made in case of uh, sugar factories. And um, okay. ah, so this is how it is made. And we were wondering how we can help them this sugar factory people. And finally, we came up with a consortium of three or four fungi. And a mixture of these four fungi was made as a microbial consortium. And this was sprayed on through aero tillers on the wind on the windrows. Okay, this was done. And this is the close-up. You can see this is the mixture of four fungi, which was in, which was introduced into the windrows and these are the fungi which we used, the Phenorochid Chrysosporium, Trichurus spiralis, and the mushroom fungus, Pleurotis soldier kaju, which were worked as excellent decomposers. And, and this decomposed these beggars of the sugarcane industry in about two and a half to three months instead of six to seven months. So this is again commonly followed by the industry in Karnataka. And not only in Karnataka, it has spread to the neighboring states also. Coming to the biocontrol organisms, and we know that uh, many of we lose our crop because of uh, pathogens and insect pests. Again, how we can control whether microbes can help in the control of insect pests and the um, and also the plant pathogens. I've just included one slide here. Let us take red gram or the pigeon pea as an example. And the serious pathogen is the Fusarium udum, which causes the wilt disease. And you can see the best biocontrol agent is Trichoderma viridae, which can control this pathogen. And so he can just go through the biocontrol agent list on various crops and various pathogens. You can see Trichoderma dominates. So Trichoderma is a very good biocontrol agent. Unfortunately, it is available in the market for a farmer to go and buy a packet of trichoderma and use it in his field, just to show an antagonistic activity. And, um, and again, nematodes are becoming a major problem in and around Bangalore, especially on solanaceous crops. And root knot nematode, the Melodagain javanica, Melodagain is becoming, see javanica and um, incardita are two species. And we know they cause damage in vegetables, pulses, oil seeds, fruits, plantations. And again, is there anything to control these nematodes? They, these are the ones which are very, very effective. Pesilomyces gelacinus and Poconia clebodosporia are very effective in controlling the nematode pathogens. And <clears throat> for the biocontrol of insect pests, again, all of us are aware of Bacillus thuringiensis, that is how the Bt cotton came into existence. And again, this Bacillus thuringiensis, and we have, uh, these are various microbial agents for the biocontrol of insect pests. Bacillus thuringiensis is a very, very effective biocontrol agent, which can be used in, not only in cotton for the bollworm, in many other crops. And again, we do have certain fungi like Bavaria, Bessiana, Metaresium, Anisophriae, and we also have a virus, nuclear polyhydrosis virus, which can be used as biocontrol agents. I've just shown one slide here of Bacillus thuringiensis, the in the vegetation, you can see the culture, and in the field when it was sprayed, it is how it has killed the, the, the larva. And this is just a slide to show Bavaria basiana. It is called as white muscardine fungus. When it is used in the field, you can see how it covers and the insect becomes diseased and dies. And this is the 
a green muscardine fungus metericium anisofriae you can see the caterpillar is just covered with a green growth and it dies and coming to the viral pesticides the nuclear polyhydrosis virus is very very effective and we have two major pests in our country which attacks a variety of crop plants helicoverpa armigera is one and spodoptera litura is the other one these are the two major pests attacking a variety of crop plants in our country again for this particular thing nuclear polyhydrosis virus is very very effective so it is very interesting to see how the insect larva dies when when we spray nuclear polyhydrosis virus when it infects the larva the larva climbs to the top of the plant and even if it's a small tree it climbs to the top of the tree and hangs upside down that is head down tail up and dies so by just looking at it you can guess that it has been killed by nuclear polyhydrosis virus and coming to biocontrol of weeds unfortunately we do not have very effective biocontrol of weeds no microorganism till today in our country is very effective in the biocontrol of weeds though lot of projects have gone in this particular direction but one particular um, biocontrol agent was and uh, and the weed on which it was very effective was mecania weed mecania weed which is very common in plantation crops and in forest area and the paxinia spezzangini was the rust which was fairly effective in again against this particular weed which was tested in cabbie in england first later on it was introduced to nbpgr in new delhi they also tested this because it should not be effective on any crop plant it should be very specific to the weed so they tried this and it was released in two states it was released in kerala and it was also released in assam but the kerala people said it is not at all effective in the first year itself assam people said the first year it was fairly effective second year said it did not work so that is how we do not have any microbe acting as a very effective biocontrol agent against weeds and this is the weed mecania and this is the biocontrol agent which was tried let us from agriculture let us very slightly move to food and see how microbes are useful in food and we know that at least in south india we know idli and dosa is the most common breakfast we have and um, for the preparation of idli what is done the batter is made in the previous evening allowed to ferment overnight and next day we get very soft idlis if we don't allow the fermentation you will get very hard idlis so why this during the fermentation what happens it is the sulfur the organic the lactic acid bacteria like leucanostrop mesenteroides works for adds on to this batter and then makes the uh, the dough very soft and the batter very soft similarly we know we go to the bakery and buy bread cakes etc again we forget what is what is added to the batter is the yeast saccharomyces cerevisiae same thing with case of yogurt the mother prepares the lukewarm milk adds the previous day small starter yogurt or the curd and then only next day morning we will get the nice curd otherwise and again which are the organisms which are responsible for this lactic acid bacteria like lactobacillus bulgaricus streptococcus thermophilus and so on similarly for the preparation of cheese soy sauces so soy sauce tempeh vinegar beer and wine uh, these organisms are used again beer and for the preparation of beer saccharomyces cerevisiae is used for the preparation of wine saccharomyces ellipsoides is used again as per the international classification beer and wine are included under food <clears throat> and at this time from andhra pradesh a group of people came to us they had some problem in aquaculture and they said the shrimps and fish they are affected by some pathogen and they are dying whether you can help us in giving some microbial inoculant i told them i have never done anything in aquaculture they said please try so that is how we just made trial and error method and we made a microbial consortium consisting of four organisms lactobacillus acidophilus nitrobacter bifidobacterium and saccharomyces 
at yeast and then thought it may work as a probiotic and we gave them and they introduced in their aquaculture ponds and they came and told me that it is working. So I really do not know how it worked, but the, the, the people, aquaculture people raising fish and prawns were very happy and they repeatedly they coming, they were came for this probiotic which we were preparing and giving it to them. Coming to the industry, again, we know that <clears throat> varieties of industrial products uh, like acids, uh, organic acids, enzymes, vitamins are all produced by our microorganisms. I just include a few slides here. Coming to organic acids, we can say acetic acid, the organism that is used is Acetobacter species, the substrate is sugarcane juice. Coming to lactic acid, again, there are two organisms which are used, lact Lactobacillus brucii and Lactobacillus bulgaricus. And the substrate will vary. In which is Lactobacillus brucii, we use whey as the substrate. If it is Lactobacillus bulgaricus, glucose is used as the substrate. Coming to amino acids, again, for industrial production of amino acids, it's the, it, they are microorganisms used for the production of Alanine, Mycobacterium aminophilum is used. For the production of leucine, it is Brevibacterium lactofermentum. For the production of threonine, it is Escherichia coli, particular strain K12 is used. Enzymes, again, when we come to enzymes, amylase, the organism that is used is Bacillus subtilis, which and this again, amylase is used in several food industries. Coming to lipases, Again, we have penicillium, the fungus penicillium chrysogenum is used and it is used in case of digestive enzymes. And in case of proteases, again, we have alkaline, neutral or acid proteases. And depending on this, we have three different organisms used, Bacillus lichenifomis, Bacillus cereus and Aspergillus species. Coming to vitamins, again, vitamin B12, the organism that is used for the production is Pseudomonas denitrificans. And also another organism is used for the production of vitamin B12 using glucose as the substrate, that is Proponial, proponial bacterium spermani. For the production of riboflavin, the fungus is used, that is Aspia gossypii. So antibiotics, I think all of us are familiar. We just go to a medical shop, buy an antibiotic when we fall sick. Many, many times we don't, we don't realize from where it has come. And it is a fungus penicillin, penicillium species that produces penicillin. When we talk of uh, streptomycin, it is streptomyces griseus, erythromycin, it is streptomyces erythreus. That these are the ones which produce the varieties of antibiotics which are available in the market today. And again, for the paper industry, we just all of us write in on paper, we really don't realize that a microorganism is used for the preparation of paper. And the, in the paper industry, the wood chips are and the pulping of the wood is done along with the fung with the fung with the help of a fungus, Panorachi chrysosporium. Uh, and this particular fungus is helps in the pulping of paper and which improves the quality of paper. Similarly, for the tanning of leather, sewage treatment, and even for the extraction of certain metals, for example, leaching of metal ores, for get the extraction of copper from copper ores, thiobacillus ferrooxidans is used, which is very cost effective and less polluting. So microbes are used in a variety of places. Let us come to biotechnology. How microbes are used in or useful in biotechnology? Let us take one or two examples and see them. For example, glyphosate is used as a weedicide, as an herbicide. So that means the farmer just sprinkles this weedicide in the field, which takes care of the weeds. Okay, but there are some crops which are sensitive to this weedicide. That means when the farmer uses glyphosate, it will kill tobacco also. So he cannot use glyphosate in tobacco field. But there are bacteria which are resistant to glyphosate. So these resistant genes from the bacteria has been, has been taken and introduced 
to tobacco through protoplast fusion. So we have genetically modified tobacco, which has this particular gene of resistance. So now the farmer can grow this tobacco and he can use glyphosate in the field and the tobacco will not be killed. This is a very, very classical example. Another example also I can give, we know that Bacillus thuringiensis, how does it kill the Lepidopter insects? Because it produces a toxin. That toxin is uh, deleterious to the insect and it kills the insect. So another a common PGPR, Pseudomonas fluorescens, I already told a lot of work has been done and if people use this for seed treatment, seedling treatment. And so what has been done, this particular gene responsible for the production of toxin from Bacillus thuringiensis has been transferred to Pseudomonas fluorescens. Now, this transformed genetically modified Pseudomonas fluorescens, it can be used for treating seeds. Okay, bio-priming, that's what we call treating seeds and sowing them to improve plant growth. And again, in cotton, there is a serious insect problem. That is the black cutworm. So which actually damages the root, it eats the root. So what happens? The rhizosphere of the cotton is covered with Pseudomonas fluorescence, which is modified with the gene of from Bacillus thuringiensis. When the black cutworm, when it nibbles and tries to eat, it takes Pseudomonas fluorescence and it dies. So this is a way in which we get the plant is secured from the cut, black cutworm infestation. Coming to industry again, we know that uh, the production of alcohol, the organism that is commonly used is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. But there is also a bacterium which is equally good for the production of alcohol, that is Zymomonas mobilis. But the problem was it, this particular bacterium cannot use, utilize the starch or cellulose. It needs only glucose for the production of alcohol, which makes it very costly for the industrial production. So classical work again done at Madurai Kabaraj University. This work was done there. And what they did, the cellulase genes from cellulomonas was introduced to Zymomonas mobilis. And now Zymomonas mobilis can utilize cellulose and produce alcohol. So the genes from Zymomonas mobilis was, was transferred and then this can, instead of utilizing glucose, it can use cellulose and give the maximum yield of ethanol. So now Zymomonas mobilis is equally good like Saccharomyces cerevisiae for the production of alcohol. Similarly, we can extend this type of work to production of antibiotics, organic acids, eight vitamins and so on. Let us think of environmental protection. We are adding so much of uh, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides to the soil. Some of them undergo easy degradation. Some of them are very difficult to degrade. And there are certain xenobiotics which cannot be degraded by certain organisms easily. And there are toxic wastes also. But we do have certain bacteria which can act on these organisms. And people have genetic, they have used genetically engineered bacteria so that they can work on these xenobiotics and toxic, toxic waste and then degrade them. And then they, these back, genetically engineered bacteria have been so designed, they can use them as an energy source, as a source of energy. This toxic waste is used as a source of energy and thereby they can eat it as a food and then decompose, degrade it. So this type of work has also been done. Such work has got a lot of, uh, in sewage treatment is a lot of um, application. Again, nanotechnology is a topic of, hot topic of the day. And again, producing nanoparticles from plants is possible, but when we use microbes, it's much cheaper because the time taken for production of nanoparticles is very less compared to production from the plants. So these nanoparticles have great significance now. 
what are the areas in which nanoparticles are applied now for the rapid diagnosis of diseases, development of vaccines, control of environmental pollution, preservation of food, etc. So silver nanoparticles are always used as biocides and antimicrobial agents. So nowadays, the trend is to use microbes for the synthesis of nanoparticles. Okay, this is another area where microbes are useful to mankind. Coming finally to biodiversity. Having said so much about the beneficial use of microorganisms, how much of microorganisms existing in nature we know? The answer is very disappointing. Okay, the answer that is given by the, the international committee is very little. Okay, that is what they have said. And so, how much of the organisms, microbes existing in nature, we know now? It is only 3%. Okay, out of 100% of microbes existing in nature, with all our isolation, discovery, all that studies we have made so far, we know only 3% of the microbial species existing in nature. So it will be very interesting to look for newer organisms. But where do we look for these new organisms? Again, the International Committee on Biodiversity just had lots of discussion on this. Finally, they, come, they have come with certain areas where we can look for these new organisms. What are the areas they have proposed? Some of the environments where it should be worthwhile exploring. Okay. So it is not 100% that you have just suggestion that has been made. One is hypersaline lakes and soils. Thermal environments, including hot deserts, mangroves, swamps, brackish waters, salt marshes, beaches, and estuaries, surface, intestines, fecal matter, and nests of insects and animals. Surface of plants growing under extreme environment, very cold place or very hot place. Ocean floors, environment saturated with sewage effluents and pollutants. This is what the International Committee has suggested as the possible area, environment from where we can find newer microorganisms. Okay, so there is ample scope for young people here to look for organisms present in these new year areas. And of course, now government of India has picked up at least one of these areas for funding. That is the surface, intestines, fecal matter of insects. They are not gone to animals. They are stopped with insects. So as one trust area of research for funding. So I think let us make use of this. Young people can uh, send a proposal on this particular area where there is funding available now. And I told that these are the new areas, uh, new environments where we can find. Now I just give one example to encourage young people here. That is, we know that at the, through nitrogen fixation, we talked about the nitrogen fixation by rhizobium. Atmospheric nitrogen is fixed by rhizobium in which form? It fixes nitrogen in the ammonical form of nitrogen. And we should also know that plants do not, majority of the plants do not take ammonical form of nitrogen. They take nitrate form, NO3 form of nitrogen. So, the rhizobium fixes nitrogen in the form of ammonical form. This ammonical form of nitrogen has to be converted to nitrite. And we know the process of nitrification, which involves two, two steps. One is ammonical form is converted to nitrite, NO2, by a particular group of organisms called as nitrosomonas. And nitrite is converted to nitrate by another genus, nitrobacter. So nitrification, as we see in textbooks till today, is a two-step process. Okay, see the recent book, 
that also it gives that it is a two step process but a recent report from university of maryland king where the scientist has discovered a new bacterium and he has named it as nitrospira what does what this particular bacterium can do it converts ammonium directly into nitrate it is one step process it is not two step process as we as we thought all these years now it is one step process so bio if you look into the new organ organisms i am sure that you will also come across some new organisms and you can bio prospect them you may get a new antibiotic you may get a new nitrogen fixer you may get a new ethanol fermenter or something which is something very new so i would urge young people to spend their time looking for these newer organisms and bio prospect them so it will be useful to mankind to you and me in future and our children in future and i think i will thank you with this and then if you have any questions you can either put it in your chat box or uh, preferably or you can ask ask me this is not working toxic heavy metals yes yeah there is one uh, particular uh, question uh, from uh, dr pradeep kumar can microbes degrade toxic heavy metals yes there are plenty of literature available that microbes can degrade toxic heavy metals you just go to the internet and that gives a title you will come across which are the organisms which can degrade toxic heavy metals Any other questions, sir? Uh, good morning. It was a wonderful talk. Uh, uh, listening uh, on microbial diversity and its uh, human welfare, sir. Actually, uh, how about the safety? I mean, to say, uh, are they host specific? To say, when we are using them as a pesticide or uh, insecticide, uh, how about their safety to other? i mean to say other forms when maybe there are beneficial insects also visiting the plant uh, for uh, pollination purpose yeah that's a, that's a very good question yeah all these tests have to be done before it is released as a organism which can be used against as a biocontrol agent again by a pesticide against a particular insect and its effect on beneficial organisms have to be seen we have to get the toxicity test approval all this there is a very long procedure before it is given uh, comes to the market very very long procedure expensive procedure also <laughs> that's what sir actually because uh, now when we uh, screen for uh, any such organism the major issue is its safety and uh, its longevity for example if you are uh, uh, isolating one particular strain that strain after subcultures it will retain its uh, ability or its uh, phenotype or not that is also a question so how to check the stability of the strain how many generations we need to wait uh, for the testing uh, or the stability of the organism you are asking about stability yeah how many say if it is producing some kind of i mean to say Uh, insecticidal activity or it is producing some kind of thing then how long it will uh, uh, when it is in its uh, original habitat it may be effective but when we are isolating it whether it will continue the same property that is my question yeah yeah i think uh, what has been reported so far is that they continue when all these are tested before it is released and then are agreed for marketing so it 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 continues it's one more question also here are you excited in when i started my research with vam few years back uh referring your textbooks never thought i'll be listening to you directly some day very excited <laughs> okay thank you very much oh, my one of the faculty member from uh, vanita college hyderabad she was very i mean to say curious to know when you'll be your talk 
yeah so that is how she is uh, very excited and uh, very glad to see your talk live okay next time next talk in this afternoon is on mycorrhiza only so you will enjoy it better i think <laughs> so any i mean to say uh, special kind of uh, support uh, the from the different funding agencies if we can, uh, if we are targeting uh, the I mean to say if we want to study such kind of uh, work are there any special funds uh, supported uh, from any funding agency you can highlight can you highlight like that which type of work you are talking to like the insect i mean to say any microbial insecticide or Yeah, 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 yeah. I think biotechnology DBT is one agent which you can definitely have because that's a one of the target uh, funding area, and also you can try CSIR. You can also try DST, and uh, so these areas will be. And if you are from an agricultural university, then even ICR will be able to fund. Yeah. So it is a molecular era. Sorry, you are, you unmute yourself, sir. By mistake, it has gone. sir it is a molecular era and yeah. uh, when we work uh, always molecular work is dominating and uh, uh, it is a costly procedure uh, so how to i mean to say work because our laboratories are not well equipped in the equipment of whatever molecular work is required yeah. i agree with you that uh, this is the molecular era that is how even in the projects what we run, right now we introduce a small bit of molecular work when we do the inoculations with mycorrhiza and pgpr we introduce that molecular tracking of the introduced organisms is given as one small component so that so we have to fly with the the direction in which the wind is blowing so so that it attracts the funding agency so they will fund it so you know, i add such a small portion of it yeah Sir, one more question has come from. Uh, yeah, I say can uh, see that. Can, can microbes, microbes help in enhanced recovery can, of petroleum? Is this a question? Can microbes help in uh, enhanced recovery of petroleum? Yeah, <laughs> I think we're here for that. Some other guy. I don't know. I really do not know. But uh, you have worked on agriculture. Ah, like, uh, uh, <laughs> organ <organic> systems. <laughs> so in present if you have seen any kind of i'm going to say notification regarding uh, such a, i'm going to say project proposals or something from any of the funding agency because you are member of so many i'm going to say uh, project review uh, yeah. committees and we do get some of these funding we do get some of them we don't say that uh, uh, sometimes they ask specifically also for such type of things so you have to be keeping on Uh, look into those websites, and sometimes they specifically ask for these things. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving wonderful talk on behalf of uh, the teachers and uh, the director and uh, myself, coordinator. I wholeheartedly express my gratitude for your uh, um, presentation, what you have enlightened us. So again, afternoon we are having your next lecture also. Yeah. So we'll be curious to be uh, for your talk again. We'll be waiting in afternoon for afternoon also. Two forty-five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Bye. Bye. <clears throat>
shall i shall i start morning sir yes you can start sharing the screen okay Uh, well, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. You're audible. Okay. Okay. In today's lecture, I'll be speaking on pollination biology of a few plants. I've, I've selected some three uh, important plants, and I will also speak about economic value of pollination service. Why we have to do this economic valuation? And uh, in the last two lectures. Uh, I spoke on evolution of plant pollinator relationships, pollinator pollination syndromes, and also on the diversity of bees and flowering phenology and pollination, how they are related with the help of an example of cardamom pollination, I explained this. Uh, and in today's lecture, as I said, I will be speaking about three important uh, plant, plant species, two of them, all the three are important crops, uh, the pollination biology of those, and then I will also speak about uh, why we have to value the, the uh, pollination service or whatever the pollination, what is the value that we can give and how it is done. Well, uh, so I'll be telling three stories. One of them is the story of a princess, then story of Cinderella's coach and the story of rattle box. I will tell you what are these. Uh, Pigeon pea, I consider it as the princess because I think dal is the favorite of everybody in every family, like a, a girl child in the family. Uh, so kajan as kajan, I consider it as the princess of all crops. And pigeon pea uh, is, it originated in Southern and or Eastern India. It is cultivated uh, in over 50 tropical and subtropical countries around the world. Many countries cultivate this, though it was it originated in southern uh, India. And the nutritional value of this uh, is very high because major it is the major protein source for vegetarians. Food and nutritional security of developing countries depends on crops like pigeon pea. Now, in India, we have 4.5 for three million hectares under pigeon pea, and we produce about 4.25 million tons. Uh, the productivity is about 950 kgs per hectare, and the potentiality for production is about 2,500 kg per hectare, which means the productivity is very low. So there is a lot of potentiality to enhance the productivity. Now there are two reasons, main reasons for low productivity, which is almost always given. One is that of the insect pests and the other of diseases. So these are the reasons why we have low productivity. But there can be another possible reason also according to me. One is the inadequate knowledge of pollination. We have inadequate knowledge of pollination of pigeon pea. And though it is often cross-pollinated, in the literature you see that it is 3 to 40% cross-pollination but the pot set is low, less than 30%. If you, if you ask any pigeon pea grower or any pigeon pea worker, he will tell that the, the pot set is only about 30% or even less than that. In some places, you'll find only about 15 or 16% of uh, the flowers setting the pots. So is there a pollinator deficit? And if so, what are the pollinators? It is, it is important to know and how we can improve the pollination efficiency of these crops. Now, for that, we have to understand the floral biology of pigeon pea. Pigeon pea flower is self-compatible. So that means it is capable of setting pods without the aid of pollination or pollinator also. It is capable of setting seeds by self-pollination. But it benefits from cross-pollination. When the flowers are visited by pollinators, it actually helps the uh, flower to set pots or to set seeds. The flower structure is very interesting. It is a papillonaceous plant. It has a standard petal, wing petals, and the keel petals. 
Now you, you know that in all these kind the, on, in this entire Fabaceae group of plants or the Papillonaceous flowers, you see that the uh, andesium and gynesium or the uh, anthers and also the uh, style and stigma, they are hidden beneath the keel petals. Okay, so it, 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 somehow it has to come out by the, the when, when a pollinator visits. So that it is a typical papillonaceous flower with standard wing and keel petals, and the stamens. There are ten stamens, and they are in two groups, dyad alphas. Nine are fused to form a column, and one stamen is free. And the ovary is superior. It is subsessile, flat dorsoventrally. It is unilocular with, with a single row of seeds with five ovules. Then minimum, there, there may be some varieties with, with more, more than five ovules, also six or seven ovules may be uh, found in some improved varieties. Now the stigma is capitate and nectaries are at the base of the style. Now the pollen ovule ratio is about 4,770 to 338 pollen grains per flower, which is about 1,000 to 1. Um, so, and it is said that it appears that this particular species is facultative xenogamous species. Facultative xenogamous means it benefits from the visitation by pollinators. So we should know what are these pollinators. Flowers are actually visited by 18 species of in insects, including 12 species of bees. So before we started doing this work, we wanted to know whether the pollinators help in any way the setting of or improving the uh, set. So what we did was for a set of 25 plants, we completely caged them. That means without allowing any pollinators to visit any flower visitors. And we left another set for open visitation, open for uh, pollinator visitation. And interestingly, we found a significant increase in the pot set. When we looked at the pot set, the pot set in the open pollinated ones is about 34%, whereas in caged ones, it is less than 20%, it's about 16%. So there was a significant increase in the pot set in plants that were left open compared to caged plants. But if flower visitors are helping, what are these visitors? We wanted to know. And we found that there are 12 species of bees nine of them belonging to the family Apidae, and three of them belong to Megachylidae. Megachylidae are the leaf cutter bees. So in Apidae, you have the Apis species, all the three species of Apis, honeybees visiting. Then we also found the carpenter bees, several species of carpenter bees visiting, and there are other stingless bees and also other solitary bees visiting. So these are the various visitors. So we wanted to find out which is the best of these. And when we looked at the frequency of visitation to the flowers, we found that we could, we could boil down to just some three or four of them. So five of them. So there are two species of Xylocopa, two species of Megachyle, that is leafcutter bees, and two species of Apis. So uh, you, we, we have found that the, of these, the major visitors were Megachyle lanata and Apis floria. So nearly 25% of the visits were by Floria, 25% of the visits were by Megachyle, and the others were, though they were relatively more frequent compared to the other species, they were less than these two species. So we wanted to uh, concentrate on Xylocopa amethystina, Megachyle lanata, and Apis Floria, these three species, and then see what is happening. So these are the, these are the three species we, want, we selected for further studies. So we did some, uh, say, experiments in which we did something like controlled visitation experiments. These are referred to as controlled visitation experiments, where we allow only a particular species of flower visitor to visit a set of flowers and compare it with no visits and with open visit, which was left for open visitation. So these three species, Megachyl lanata, Xero, uh, Xylocopa amethystina, and Apis floria, were, were allowed 15 visits to a single flower for a set of 50 flowers. So we had several sets of 50 flowers, for which one set we allowed only Megachyl lanata, for another set we allowed only Xylocopa, for another set we allowed only Apis floria. And we also had a set with open visits and with no visits, which completely uh, devoid of any visitation by any uh, flower visitor. Now, interestingly, you see that 
there is no significant difference in the set, pod set, between the plants or the flowers which received xylocopa or Apis floria visitation with no visits. That means with no visits, the, the flowers are setting by self-pollination and in all probability in both xylocopa and uh, Apis floria also, it is by self-pollination only. Their, their effort in pollination may be very, very less. But that is not true in case of Megachel lanata because Megachel lanata was almost equal to the open pollination. So there was no significant difference between the set in case of Megachel lanata allowed flowers with com when compared to the open pollinated flowers. So it appears that Megachel lanata is the important pollinator for Kajanas Kajan or Pigeon P. So we wanted to look at uh, any more reasons are there to consider this as the best pollinator. Now, Megachel lanata is a leaf cutter bee. We should know what is a leaf cutter bee also. It's a leaf, it is called a leaf cutter bee because it actually cuts leaves of some plants and then it uses them to uh, line the cells that it makes. For it is a solitary bee. It nests in tree ho in hollows that are available in the ground or in plants. And then it takes these pieces of leaves, it cuts pieces of leaves and then lines these hollows, hollow tubes with these and then makes the cells. So they are called so because they actually, you cut leaves for building their nests. Uh, the, the individual females make cells in existing hollows or in the soil and line their cells with bits of leaves they cut from specific plants. Once the cell is ready, they fill about three-fourths of the cell with a mixture of pollen and nectar, lay an egg, and close the cell with several bits of leaf discs. So the, this, this is their uh, way of const constructing the nest. And then they continue with the next cell. So in a given place, in a given place, if the space is more available, they may make about six or seven cells continuously, one above the other or one after the other, and then they shift to another hole like that, available uh, hole like that, where they continue to make some more cells. So this is how the leaf cutter bee cuts the leaves. And you, you might have seen these kind of cuts on rose plants. Okay, on rose plants, you find this kind of uh, cuts with the discs which have been cut by the uh, leaf cutter bees and then taken for their own, for making their nests. So they carry the uh, leaves like this to their nests and make the cells in the existing hollows like this. It may be in, in, in a wood, in a tree, or in the walls, the hollows might be there, or even in the soil. Some, some bees, they nest in the soil. And then they make these kind of cells using these leaf bits. And within the cell, actually, they load it with, uh, um, with a mixture of pollen and nectar, lay an egg on that, and this egg has hatched, this is a small larva, which continuously feeds on this mixture, and then it, it comes out as an adult. After its complete development, it comes out as an adult. So that is the biology of the leaf cutter bee. And if you want to, if, if, when we are looking at the reasons why we should consider the leaf cutter bee as uh, the major pollinator of pigeon bee, we found that the leaf cutter bee, it spends least time searching for the flowers. So it, it can find a flower with the least time compared to xylocopa or Apis floria. And it also visits more number of flowers per unit time. So the number of flowers visited by the uh, bee also is higher com comparatively when, when you compare it with the other flower, flower visitors. So this is one thing. So Megachel lanata spends least time searching for the flower and visits maximum number of flowers per unit time. Now, the most interesting thing is Megachel species, the leaf cutter bees also are better equipped for pollination of pigeon bee because they know where the nectar is. They insert their mandibles here at the base of the uh, standard petal and then they press the wing petals so that the um, with, with the weight, they actually exert pressure here. And from the keel petal, below the keel petal, I said the, um, the, the anthers and the, the, the stigma are, are hidden and that is exposed. And that comes in contact with the hairs that these bees have on the ventral aspect of the abdomen. 
So they have special hairs here, which are called as copae, and which actually collect the pollen. So when it is visiting the next, next flower, it actually deposits, it comes in contact with the stigma and the pollen is deposited. And that is how this is an efficient pollinator, we can, we can say. So we can say that megachyle is better equipped for pollination of these kind of plants. So can pot set be improved by increasing the leaf cutter bee pop population? As we say that in uh, under natural conditions, the leaf cutter bee populations, because they are solitary, their numbers will be less. So the number of uh, bees vis visiting the flowers will be relatively less if their population is less. So in a cultivated area, whether we can increase the populations of leaf cutter bees and so thereby can we increase the productivity of this crop. This is what we tried to look at. So we selected a plot with about 4,800 plants pigeon bee plants and placed 20 trap nests 10 meters apart. The trap nests we made using hollow ipomia stems. Ipomia is a weed, it is a, it is a kind of a climber and you, you will get it in, in many places. And we collected these, these beads and then we cut the stems into about six inches long and we dried them and it is a hollow tube. It, it comes as a hollow tube, uh, hollow stem. And in each trap, and we place these, about 12 to 15 of them in inside a PVC tube of about the same length. Okay, so each trap nest contained about 12 to 15, 15 centimeter long hollow reeds. So in total, we had kept about 720 nesting sites for, for the bees. So in the same plot, about 40 plants were caged to exclude flower visitors, okay? And we also had another plot about 500 meters away for open pollination. So we wanted to check whether the, the percent set, the pot set, when we increase whether, the, whether these uh, bees occupy the nest that we have provided. In fact, nearly 30% of the nests were, of the reeds were occupied. So that means that there was a very huge, we, we cannot expect them to occupy all the 720. So we got about 200 and, and odd uh, numbers which were occupied. So about nearly about 30% were occupied by the megachylates. So the population was definitely more in the plot. Whether this had any influence in the pot set, in the percent pot set in this plot compared to the plants which are completely closed, caged, or the plants which are left for open pollination elsewhere. So this we complained and we recorded the observations on the pot set in all these three situations. And we found that providing nesting sites increased LCB population and increased activity of the leaf cutter bee Populate, uh, leaf cutter bees almost doubled the pot set. You see that under open pollination, the pot set was about 35%, and in where the leaf cutter bee population was increased, it went above 60%. And in the caged situation, it was less than 20%. So, in, in fact, this is an indication to show that by conserving leaf cutter bees, we can actually enhance the production in um, uh, pigeon bee. Though pigeon pea is self-compatible, it is benefited by uh, leaf cutter bee visits. The flower structure appears to have evolved for pollination by megachyle species. And by increasing the nesting sites for leaf cutter bees, we can actually increase the pot set significantly. In fact, we are repeating this experiment so that we can actually uh, give it as a recommendation to the farmers. Now, interestingly, this kind, this method of uh, enhancing uh, solitary bee populations is followed in many countries already. It is being followed in many countries already. And what they call it as bee hotels. They, they actually use uh, large blocks of wood and then drill holes into that and then keep those, the, the, those as bee hotels in the, in the field so that solitary bee populations increase or solitary bee populations can be conserved. So this is already going on and then we are trying to promote that even in this country. Okay, the next story is that of the Cinderella coach. The Cinderella coach, I think everybody knows about the Cinderella story, uh, who will be assisted by a fairy uh, godmother, who will be helped by a fairy godmother to visit, to go to a party organized in, in, the, in the palace. And for that, a pumpkin is used as the, as the coach. 
Okay, so instead of pumpkin, I'll be talking about muskmelon, Cucumis mellow, pollination in muskmelon. Muskmelon, in, interestingly, is andromonaceous. Andromonaceous means there, there are hermaphrodite flowers and there are also staminate flowers. So two types of flowers are produced in muskmelon. Hermaphrodite flowers, wherein you have both the ovaries, both the gynesium and also the andrisium is there. Whereas in staminate flowers, there are, there are only stamens and the pollen grains uh, are produced. Uh, anthers are there and then the pollen grains are produced. But in the hermaphrodite flower, both the ovary, style and stigma, and also the stamens with anthers are present. And the pollen is produced in the hermaphrodite flowers also. Now, this is uh, the uh, photographs of the flowers. This is the hermaphrodite flower and this is the staminate flower. You can easily identify a hermaphrodite flower by the ovary. The ovary is enlarged, whereas the staminate flowers will not have an ovary. It is very simple and it is smaller compared to the hermaphrodite flower. So you see the calyx, ovary, and then uh, the corolla, the difference is staminate flower and the hermaphrodite flowers. So relatively, the hermaphrodite flower is smaller in size. Now, the uh, muskmelon flowers are visited by several species of bees, including Apis floria, Apis sarana, Apis dorsata, all these are honeybees. Then there are some solitary bees like Ceretina species and Lysioglossum species. So all these are uh, frequent, we can, we can say, you, know, you can see them visiting the flowers of muskmelon. But of these, Apis floria and Apis serana appear to be more frequent visitors. So when we looked at the frequency of visitation by these bees, we find that floria and serana are the most frequent visitors. And in fact, you can keep the boxes of Apis serana in the field and then see that the um, activity is increased on, on, the, on the flowers. Now, the questions that we asked when we started working on this crop was that why there are staminate flowers when hermaphrodite flowers are there? Hermaphrodite flowers are there, the stamens are there, the pollen is being produced, and when that is there, like in many other crops, many other plant species, why in muskmelon you should have a staminate flower separately? So this is one very interesting question. And the next question is, if the staminate flower and hermaphrodite flower both are producing pollen, is there any difference in the pollen? Are pollen from hermaphrodite flowers and those from staminate flowers the same? in structure, viability, and fertility. So otherwise, there is, there is no reason why, the staminate, why, why these two kinds of uh, flowers should be there. So does the male part of the hermaphrodite flower is helping in any way to increase fruit set? So these are some of the questions that we asked right in the beginning. And when you look, when you go to a field uh, of muskmelon and count the number of flowers that are there, you see that there is a very large number of staminate flowers compared to the hermaphrodite flowers. The ratio is about 18 is to 1. So for 18 staminate flowers, there is one hermaphrodite flower. Or uh, for that matter, for every hermaphrodite flower, there are 18 staminate flowers. Now the next question is, when a bee is visiting a plant, when a bee visits a, a muskmelon uh, plot, it sees mostly the staminate flowers. So in, invariably it visits the staminate flowers and then it, it, it may accidentally visit hermaphrodite flowers because the number of staminate flowers is so many. So the chances of it visiting a staminate flower is almost 18 times more by if you are looking at the number of flowers. And the pollen abundance, if you see the, if you, if you look at the number of pollen grains produced by the staminate flower and the hermaphrodite flowers, you see that there is some difference. There is some significant difference. The number of pollen grains produced in a staminate flower is something like nearly 5,000 pollen grains are produced per flower. Whereas in case of, a, in a hermaphrodite flower, the number of pollen grains produced is nearly half of that. Okay, 2,700 uh, pollen grains are produced in the hermaphrodite flower. So there is one difference in, the, in terms of the quantity of the pollen grains that are produced. Then coming to the pollen viability, the pollen viability, when you test the pollen viability in the lab, you see that the pollen of staminate flowers is slightly more. It is about 43%, 42.9% compared to the hermaphrodite flowers, which is also viable 
which uh, is about 30 per 30.5 percent. So pollen viability of pollen is both the pollen, pollen grains are viable. Okay, it may be slightly more in case of staminate flowers compared to the hermaphrodite flowers. Then the next important thing is when the pollen grain is put on the stigma of the uh, uh, in, a, in a hermaphrodite flower, the staminate flower, the, the pollen grain from the staminate uh, flower, it grows faster and then the pollen tube is much longer compared to the pollen grains from a hermaphrodite flower, which is dropped on the stigma. Okay, so it is significantly faster and significantly higher, longer. It is 7.9 millimeters and it is, it, it is only 1.1 millimeters. So the chances of the, uh, the pollen, pollen tube reaching the ovule in a hermaphrodite flower from a hermo, the pollen grain from a hermaphrodite flower is very, very less or it may, it may be almost zero because the stigma to the first ovule length itself is about 6.5 millimeters. So the, the possibility of this reaching the ovule is very less. That mean, does it mean to say that hermaphrodite flowers, the pollen grains produced in the hermaphrodite flowers are not useful in fertilizing the ovules? It is the pollen grains from the staminate flowers which are actually fertilizing the ovules in the hermaphrodite flowers. Now pollen from hermaphrodite flowers, we did some experiments with this with open pollination. In each case, we, we had uh, 30 flowers. So in open pollination and then selfing, that means a hermaphrodite flower selfed with the pollen grains from the same flower. And then another one, pollen from, the, from another uh, hermaphrodite flower being uh, hand pollinated to a different hermaphrodite flower and pollen from the staminate flower used for hand pollination and then bagging for no, without any uh, pollination, okay? So you see that with open pollination and pollen from staminate flowers, you find almost 100% fruit set, whereas pollen from hermaphrodite flower is not setting any fruit. So this is this was the proof that we got for this work. So the hermaphrodite flowers that were pollinated using pollen from the same flower or from the hermaphrodite flowers did not result in any fruit set. On the other hand, with pollen from staminate flowers resulted in 100% fruit set. So what is the purpose of pollen in hermaphrodite flowers? Why it is producing pollen in the hermaphrodite flowers is the next important question to be answered. Then what we did was, we did some emasculation studies in which the, uh, the set, we had sets of hermaphrodite flowers. So, so in sets of hermaphrodite flowers, in one of the sets we emasculated, that means we removed all the stamens and the anther, including the anthers, all the stamens were removed. Whereas we left another set with hermaphrodite, uh, of hermaphrodite flowers with the uh, male part. So you find that in the normal hermaphrodite flower, there was 100% fruit set, whereas in the emasculated hermaphrodite flowers, there was less fruit set, it was only about 80%. So there is, there is, though in the fruit set, there is no significant difference. It was slightly less, about 80% fruit set or 20% less fruit set. But interestingly, there was significant difference in the number of seeds that were setting, the number of seeds in the uh, fruits, because the seeds actually um, result, actually help in the shape of the fruit and also the size of the fruit. So the number of seeds that were set in normal hermaphrodite flowers was about 250, whereas here it is less than 130, 130 seeds. So there was significant difference in the number of seeds set. Why? So the next question is why it is happening in emasculated? Because in emasculated, why either it is a normal hermaphrodite flower or an emasculated hermaphrodite flower, the pollen that is fertilizing is coming from the staminate flower only, but why the emasculated hermaphrodite flower should set less. So that is why the difference in fruit set and seed number. So then we looked at the activity of the pollinators or the, flower, or the, or the bees that were visiting. We find that in normal flowers, normal hermaphrodite flowers, a bee spends more time, significantly more time compared to a, a, a emasculated hermaphrodite flower. 
This is mainly because a bee which is visiting, it is actually searching for the pollen. And if there is no pollen here, it is not spending any, any time. So it, when it is searching for pollen in the normal hermaphrodite flower, the chances of it depositing more pollen that it has brought from the staminate flowers is higher, whether it is Apisarana or Apis Garsata, it, it, it is the same. So the number of pollen grains deposited is also more significantly higher in the normal flowers compared to the emasculated flowers. So pollinators spend less time on emasculated flowers and in normal flowers, bees spend more time as they also collected pollen. So probably they were collecting pollen for taking back, taking to their hives. So muskmelon requires bees, including wild bee species for pollination. And in the muskmelon, the male part in hermaphrodite flowers probably helps in retaining bees for more time and improve fruit set and seed set. And that is the uh, story of the muskmelon. So before I go to the next one, if there are any questions, I am ready to answer. You have any questions? Sir, uh, yeah. what could be the reason that uh, the monoecious and dioecious species, I mean, the flowers are uh, having uh, yeah. um, pollen viability more and less? What could be the, uh, the any specific reason it may in, be? In the hermaphrodite flowers, the pollen uh, is not meant for, uh, say, fertilization. So that is that is the thing. It is actually given as a reward to the pollinator. So probably this kind of a thing, that is the reason why it has retained in the, the instead of becoming completely monoecious or dioecious, the andromonoecious is, is retained in this to attract pollinators, probably. So that is the thing. So it will be uh, uh, food for the insects. Food for the bees, yeah. Bees collect yeah. and take it. Oh, oh. Yeah, that's how it is. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, the, ne the next story that I would like to you know, talk about is the story of the rattle box. You know what is a rattle box? It's a small, it's a box in which you put some coins and then make sound. But there is a plant which is also called as a rattle box. It is Crotalaria gentia because when the parts dry up, the seeds will be free inside, and then if you just shake them, you, you hear the noise, a rattling noise. In fact, it is also called as rattle pod or rattle box. Okay. Um, so what I'm trying to tell in this is bed hedging in sunhap or crotalaria juncia. Well, I, I'd like to explain what is bed hedging uh, before I go into the pollination biology of this plant. So bed hedging is something like People advise you not to put all your eggs in one basket because at least if you are keeping in two separate boxes or baskets, some of them will be safe, some of them will not be spoiled. So that is, that is the reason. So a plant that produces lots of seeds in one go, some seeds germinate immediately while a few remain dormant for a considerable time. It increases the chances of survival in case there is a drop. Supposing if all the seeds are to germinate immediately, Supposing if there is a drought, the plant, the, the species is not going to survive because the, all, the, all the, uh, the, the entire seeds will go waste. But if some seeds remain dormant and maybe after some time, the moisture level improves uh, or the conditions improve for germination, the, those seeds will germinate and this improves the fitness of the species. So this is a bed, bed hedging that many species of plants follow. Okay, in the in the wild, mainly in the wild, many species follow follow this because all all the uh, seeds will not germinate immediately. Some of the bees will be thrown and then it will be idle. And then when the rains come, they they germinate. So that's how it is. So in, we'll see what happens in case of uh, uh, this one in uh, Crotalaria gentia sunhem. Uh, with reference to pollination, how the bed hedging is uh, carried out here. So sunhemp is a crop from tropical Asia again. It's about 2.5 to 3 meters high. It is mainly used as green manure, fodder, or fiber. And it is also a source of biofuel. The, uh, and in India, we have about 35,000 hectares, 25 tons per hectare green matter is produced, and 15 tons per hectare 
forage is produced and it is very common in many fields uh, after the, before the before taking up any crop many farmers they go in for sowing this or uh, planting this uh, sun hemp and then they incorporate incorporate the entire uh, plants into the soil to improve the fertility of the soil okay so that's how it, it becomes an important green manure in many places now if you look at the flower structure this is also a, a papilionaceous flower long fibacy terminal raceme inflorescence flower is complete zygomorphic pentameters five fused petals five free petals 10 free stamens and here the stamens again are in two holes holes dimorphic the first hole of five stamens these two batches they are not in, in they are not tied together they are free but there are five long stamens and then five short stamens so this is this is interesting so the first hole of five stamens with elongate anthers in short filaments so these are the ones okay and the second hole of five stamens or globose and they are long filaments. The anthers are smaller, globose, and they are with short, uh, with, with, with long filaments. So we call this as long stamens and these as short stamens. So two types of stamens we have. Now the flower itself, the longevity is more than one day. It, it remains open or it remains attractive for nearly three days, okay? For the for the pollinators, so and you also see that from the from day one from the day of anthesis till the third day, the flowers the, the stigma remains receptive. Okay, so you, even if you are transferring pollen grains on the third day, you you will still or seventy two hours after the anthesis, you will still see the pot setting. Okay, so the person spots up and hand pollinated on different days after anthesis, an indication of stigma receptivity. So stigma rem remains receptive for nearly three days. Now, <clears throat> if you're looking at the pollen, so I said there are two types of stamens and these two stamens, both of them produce pollen. And again, we wanted to look at the quality of these pollen. So what, what, how, how are they different? So interestingly, we found that when you look at the viability of the pollen, viability of, of the, this is, this is the short, short stamen pollen, the viability of the pollen produced in the short stamen is very high on the first two days, on the first day until 24 hours, till the end of 24 hours. So at anthesis, even before anthesis, it is, it is uh, viable. And at the time of anthesis, it is viable. And at, uh, it, it is very high. And at uh, around 24 hours after anthesis, it is, again, it is still with about 72% uh, germination. So it, it, its viability is high. But from the third day onwards, from the second day onwards, it reduces. And by the third day, it reaches very low, le less than 10% viability. Whereas the same thing does not happen with the pollen from the long stamen. So the long stamen are not viable in the beginning, in the first two day, in the first day. And in the second day, after 48 hours, the, the germination percentage is high viability is high and it is very high on the second and third day. So this is an interesting thing which we wanted to look at why this is happening. Now the pot set, if you use to look at the fertility of this or, or the uh, how good these, these pollen grains are, we actually did some um, hand pollination with the pollen from short stamen and the pollen from the long stamen. And you see that the short stem and pollen are more uh, fertile. You can say the percent pot set is high, more than 40, 45% pot set is there. Pollen from the long stamen is about 30%. It is still viable. It is, it is still uh, fertile. And in open pollination, you'll find about that, the mean of this. So pot set um, happens whether it is from the short stamen or the long stamen. So it is only the viability uh, on different days. Now, when we looked at the different species of bees that are that are visiting, you again find many of the megachylid species, leafcutter bees, and also the honey bees and other solitary bees visiting. But again, it is the megachylids which were found to be more effective pollinators. But I don't go into the details of that. It is very similar to the one that happens in case of uh, pigeon bee. Now, again, here the 
mega visits and then it, it is it, it, it takes uh, nectar and when it is taken uh, taking nectar it comes in contact with the stamen and the anthers and then that is how the pollination occurs in in crotal area also now <clears throat> we we find very interesting thing with reference to the well, the age of the flowers as the flower age advances you see that the filaments of the anthers it start they start growing the filaments of of the stamens it they uh, start growing like in case of the this is the long stamen and this is the short stamen i mean this is the style this is the short stamen the yellow one is the short stamen and the white one is the long stamen so you see that on the in, in the bud bud stage both the long stamen and the short stamen will be of the same size and at 24 hours by the time the flower uh, after anthesis 24 hours after anthesis you see that the long stamen has already started growing and the short stamen is um, about um, near less than what the long stamen is and you see that the the style also is growing and then it reaches about nearly 20 mm okay the the long, the style the, the stigma is is there at about 20 mm now the short stamen it ceases growing and then it will not grow further beyond 10 10 mm but after 24 hours by 48 hours the long stamen has grown this far nearly about you know, it has exceeded 15 mm and by the third day it has crossed the level of the style it has reached almost the level of the stigma okay so this is the relative growth of filaments of short and long stamens and style with age of the flower okay so this why this is happening is is the most interesting thing now if you are looking at the pod set and pod retention with and without pollinator visitation if the, if you are not allowing the pollinators to visit at all okay even then you see that the pod set pod set is about 50% or 50 to 55% even when the pollinators are not visiting so that means this is mainly because of self pollination or only because of self pollination whereas when the pollinators are visiting then the the pod set can be more than 75% okay so the uh, interesting thing here is what i want to make uh, the point here is in sunham due to some reasons if the pollinator is not available the plant can still survive and reproduce by delayed self pollination this is what is happening in sunflower the, the if the pollinator population is not there if the pollinators are not visiting the long stamen continues to grow and then it reaches the level of the style and by the third day it is ready for pollinating this you know that the the pollen are more viable in the long stamens on the third day and by the third day it reaches the level of the style level of the stigma and then it brings about self pollination so this is what is called as delayed self pollination which is a very important thing in several species of plants in maybe not many plants but this is a wonderful adaptation hence this is an example an excellent example i should say for bed hedging in plant kingdom that means if the pollinator is not there so what is the problem i can still survive by self pollination i can wait for the pollination pollinator and if the pollinator is not active it is not interested in my flowers i can still set seeds okay so that that is this is the story of sunamp or the rattle box any any questions sir before i go to the economic valuation <clears throat> any any questions one question from my side is yes yeah uh, why the when to say the short and long kind of uh, things yeah. will be there oh i think i think you should ask is the plant genetically side. is it a genetically yeah sorry? it must be it must be it, it, it is the case with many of these uh, crotalaria spe species this so this kind in of future, in future whether this short ones will also help in pollination or they will remain no, the shorter ones actually help in pollination actually the, the shorter ones are the ones which are used for pollination by the bees when the bees are visiting in the, on the first and second day they will be actually coming in contact with the shorter ones only they are the ones which are viable uh, the pollen grains highly viable so they are collecting the pollen and then they are actually helping in pollination so initially if the pollination occurs within one day on the on the day of anthesis and within one day 
than it is by the shorter pollen, I mean shorter uh, stamen pollen. And if the if if no bee is visiting, then it it is by the uh, long stamen pollen. So that is that is how it is. It is. I can send you that paper, sir. It is interesting. We have published this paper also. Sir, yeah. Sir, one more question. Uh, yeah. Sir, till pollination gets complete, the nectar uh, release will be a continuous process, or uh, how it will be? Yeah. Nectar in many plants, it is continuous, sir. In many plants, it is continuous. Nectar is continuous, but in some species of plants, uh, where there are, uh, say, the flowers are in groups, you after pollination, that particular flower stops stops producing nectar so that the pollinator will know there is no nectar in this i need not waste my time putting my proboscis into this and then there is another they, they change the color also as you see in yeah. case of lantana in lantana flowers you see two types of two colors yeah, so yeah. the inner hole will be of a different color the outer hole will be of a different color so the outer hole will be already pollinated and there will be no nectar in that when a butterfly visits lantana it knows where the nectar is by the color of the uh, flower. So that is, I mean, it is there in many species of uh, plants like oh that. Oh my God, really it is uh, yeah. so programmed pro it's process actually. Fascinating, really, yes. Yeah. They don't waste any of their yes, uh, energy uh, for uh, the pollinator energy also. Or they yeah. don't, uh, means the genes are very, what is it? Yes, sir. Yeah. Very tightly regulated, not... Uh, Perfect, yeah. So once the, uh, if it is the bisexual flower is there, Yes. After the fertilization, they will stop their nectar. That is a yes, common right. concept. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, I'll continue with economic valuation of pollination service. Why we have to do this? Why we need this? So, pollination is an ecosystem. It is considered as an ecosystem service. It is it is development of the idea and classification of the ecosystem services. Uh, it is not very recent. It was there earlier also. Uh, because we get so many services from nature and we do not value for that. So uh, why pollination is an important ecosystem service for horticultural crops? I'll just give two examples and then to uh, tell about that. So the idea is not new, as I said. Plato, as long back as 400 BC, he said that deforestation would lead to soil erosion and drying of springs, so we need to protect forests. So it, it, is, it, it is an idea of uh, uh, ecosystem service. So they were aware of the complex services provided by nature to humans long back, though we are neglecting today. And in fact, uh, E.F. Schumacher, in one of his beautiful, wonderful books, which was published long back in 1973, Small is Beautiful, uh, he talks about economics as if people mattered. Uh, and, and he says that in economics, when we are talking about economics, we think about only human beings. Okay, we do not think that the nature is important or the ecosystem is important. So he coined the term, what is called as natural capital to drive home the point that natural resources are to be treated as capital that we keep as money and conserve and that we should spend only the interest that is earned so that the capital is safe. So if you have a lot of money, you keep it in the bank and then survive on the interest that you are earning on, on, on the capital, you are not using the capital. If you start using the capital, one fine day you will be uh, without, without any, any money. So it is similar to that. So this is a very interesting uh, point that Schumacher made long back. So it is uh, it became more common since 1970s. So ecosystem services are the benefits people obtain from ecosystems. So in 2006, there was a Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Meeting at the global level. So the, this is the definition given by the uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. So uh, Millennium Assessment also delineated four categories of ecosystem services, which are referred to as provisioning, regulating, supporting, and cultural services that we get from nature, okay? So these are, one minute. So the provisioning, supporting are the nutrition, nutrient cycling, soil formation, and primary production. Then provisioning food, fresh water, wood and fiber, fuel, then regulating climate regulation, food regulation, diseases, then disease regulation, water purification, etc. Then cultural is aesthetic, spiritual, educational, recreation, etc. So in, within this, we also get the pollination as an ecosystem service. So provisioning services, regulation services, 
cultural services and supporting services. So pollinators come under the regulation services. So pollinators actually regulate the survival or they regulate the biodiversity. We can, we can say the survival of several species of plants and animals. So that is why they are very important ecosystem services. So pollination and pollinators, these are essential service to crops and wild plants. They are vectors of genetic exchange, essential in obligate mutualisms, provide other ecosystem services. They are essential in obligate mutualisms, like in case of fig, fig wasps, where uh, the figs cannot survive without the fig wasps, and the fig wasps cannot survive without figs. And they provide other ecosystem services because there are several species of animals and birds which survive in the wild because of the service rendered by the pollinators. So why we need to evaluate uh, economically the pollination service? So for this, we have to, uh, it is very important because to impress upon the policy makers, we have to give a value for the pollination service. So we have to identify what is the pollination service, what is the benefit that we are getting from the pollinators and why we have to conserve or take measures to conserve pollinators or the habitats for pollinators. So the crops have to be identified and the area under cultivation. The pollinator dependency ratio has to be one note for each crop or each plant. What is the pollinator dependency ratio? That means how far it is dependent on the pollinator. Like as I said, there are several species of plants which are self-pollinated and they are also benefited from cross-pollination. So what is the benefit from the cross-pollination? And, or if the, whether the crop is completely dependent on the pollinator. Like for example, most of the cucurbit, cucurbits, they are either monoecious or dioecious or andromonoecious. So they depend exclusively on flower visitors for pollination. So 100% dependency is there. Now, what is the annual production of the crop? We are, when we are talking about the crops, then what is the price per unit produce and what is the crop vulnerability ratio? So these are the things which you have to work out. So pollination dependency ratio has to be worked out for individual crops. Need, it needs detailed studies on pollination biology of the crops selected. We should understand the pollination biology we should, from the point of view of the pollinator also. It is not just the floral biology. We have to understand the pollination biology of the crop that we have selected. Then the pollination efficiency of the flower visitor. Though a particular plant, a flower, particular type of flower or particular species is visited by a dozen species of insects or pollinators, which is the best pollinator, which is the most efficient pollinator, or then more than one species of pollinator which are efficient. So these are important things that we have to identify. And identify the most efficient pollinator, conduct exclusion experiments to determine the actual role of pollinators so that we know which is the pollinator that we have to concentrate on, what is its biology, where it nests, how it nests, how we can improve its population, and how we can conserve the habitats for those pollinators. So pollinator exclusion experiments are done with and without pollinators, which I explained in a couple of examples which I used in today's lecture. Sets of plants to be enclosed in cages, a similar set left for open pollination, number of flowers produced, and the number of fruits or pods or seeds set, percent difference in the in setting between the two treatments. So these are some of the data that we have to uh, collect before identifying which is, which is the best pollinator. And it is expressed as a fraction of one. So the pollinator dependency ratio, if there is no difference, if there is none, then it is zero. That means it, it does not require any pollinator. If it is little, if it is only five to 10% setting is there because of the pollinator, then it is 0 0.05. It is modest, that is 25 to 40% set is there because of the pollinator, then it is 0 0.25. If it is high, more than 50% set is there, then it is 0 0.65 and it is essential. That means it is not setting any fruits without pollinators that is either 100% or at least more than 80%, then it is 0 0.95. So this is the PD. PDI, it is called Pollinator Dependency Index, which, which is used uh, with, the, with these ratios. So productivity also, we have, and production also, we should have data, area and production of the crop to be obtained from published sources. So you, you need not collect it. it, it is available on the net. FAO reports are there, national production reports will be there. 
uh, Indian Council of Agriculture Research, different, uh, say, uh, research stations, research institutes are there which have reports. The State Department of Agriculture reports are there for the state. And uh, they, they should have a basis. You should have a basis also, okay, for getting all these. So what is the source of this? Okay, of, of the uh, of the information that you are having, and what is the total area, and what is the productivity? You have you should have this data area multiplied by productivity. Okay, so that that is area multiplied by, multiplied by productivity gives you the total value of the crop. So EVP or economic valuation of pollinator can be for an individual crop. It can be for a group of crops, it can be for the state or for the zone or region or for the country or for the entire world. So you can have the economic valuation. So pollinator dependency index, as I said, exclusively in such pollinated crops, you have the PDI as 0.95, greatly benefited is 0.65, most modest benefit is 0.25 and very little benefit is 0 0.05, no benefit means it is zero. So the total annual production multiplied by unit price gives you the TVC or the total value of the crop. So for working out the economic value of the pollination service, you multiply the pollination de dependency index, PDI, with the TVC, you get a value in terms of money. So what is the, what is the total money that you are getting because of the pollinators? So one case study that I'm taking is that of cardamom. The total production of cardamom during the last year was 20,650 tons. The unit price is 1,072 rupees per kg. So the pollination dependency is 0.95. The total value of production comes to 2,213.6 crores of rupees. And the value of the pollination service, this multiplied by 0.95, it is 2,103 crores. So this is the value of the, value of the bees, okay? If the bees were not there, we would have lost almost the entire thing. Even you know, I think it should be taken as one only year because it is 100% dependent on the on, uh, pollinators. The next one I'm taking is pigeon pea. The total production is something like four, 46 lakh tons. Okay, the total production. The unit price is 53,000 rupees per ton. And the pollination dependency, we can take it as 0.25 because it is also self-pollinated. And the total value of the production is 24,380 crores. And the value of the pollination service is 6,095 crores because of the solitary bees. We are getting so much because of the bees. So likewise, we have worked out for several other crops, like for coffee, it is 1,926. For, pit, for muskmelon, it is 2,924 crores. Bitter gold, it is 2,287 crores. Then for Brinjan, it is 6,493 crores. And for Goa, it is 7,377 crores. So the total for these seven crops, it comes to something like 29,207 crores that we are not accounting. Okay, we are getting a benefit equivalent to 29,000 crores in these seven crops for our country, for the, for the country. Okay, so that, 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 that is not a small, small amount. And this is the kind of data that we should use to impress upon the <clears throat> policymakers for taking measures for conserving pollinators. So working out economic value of pollination service is important for conserving pollinators, for conserving their nesting habits, for conserving biodiversity, and mainly for impressing upon the policymakers for taking, make, taking this issue as important for conserving habitats, conserving biodiversity, for conserve, because we are getting so much of benefit. It is only with, with, with a few cultivated crops that I have taken the example, but if you take all, all the crops that we have, in India, we cultivate nearly 111 species of crops. And there are so many species of wild plants, which are also not to be neglected. So the, the, the uh, value of pollinators is really very, very high. I think I'll stop with this. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Dear and participants, please uh, post the questions in chat box. Yeah. 
or unmute yourself you can unmute yourself and uh, interact with sir yeah sir it was wonderful to see that even uh, doing open pollination you have uh, evaluated the yes sir uh, yes price yes. market price of uh, the process whatever process is there the process is not uh, um, let's say uh, uh, it's uh, economically also you have balanced the yes, sir, yeah. doing work is one side in fact, that is that is the in thing now sir yeah uh, the economic value matters everywhere in a, each and every i would say uh, yeah. experiment so you have balanced uh, the yes, work yeah. with the um, commercial value uh, yeah. output yes, how sir. much they are doing yeah. in fact i have a wonderful team tomorrow i'll put the photo photograph of my team you <laughs> I, I have uh, good students who what are the, do most of the time. You most have of compared the number of crops like PGNP and uh, yeah. uh, cardamom, yeah. uh, totalaria. Yeah. Are uh, the same insects uh, uh, found in no, all the? No, they are different, sir. The cardamom it is honeybees. Cardamom and muskmelon, you see that the honeybees are involved. In PGNP and crotalaria, it is the leaf cutter bees which are which are, which are important. So like that, there are different species. Like, for example, if you take other species of pulses, there are some species of carpenter bees, which are very important as pollinators. So for each crop, it is important to identify which is the most efficient pollinator to, to, to uh, say, conserve. So that is the thing. So instead of nectar, they will be also feeding the... Yeah, they will be collecting pollen also. Yeah, that is the reason a plant produces more number of pollen. So they, it, it is also offering pollen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, pollen they, mainly is a protein source for the bees. So they actually collect a lot of pollen. So the uh, when there is a non-availability of uh, flower and pollen, yeah. what will be the bees doing? I mean, so how they will be surviving? Yeah, there will there will be many wild species of plants. So for conservation, one of the things that is uh, coming up now in in the recent years is. Uh, what is called as landscape management. So even in the agricultural fields, the farmers are to be advised to take to not to completely remove all the weeds that are there around, or to, to plant some species of plants which flower in the non-cropping season so that the bees are retained in, in the field. So all these things, like in, in case of in cardamom and coffee, we worked out the shade trees, the uh, flo fl floral calendars of the plants that are there in the uh, in the estates and how they differ and all that. So it, it will be very interesting. So some of those studies. Uh, how about the life expectancy of one fly? How many? How much time there will be for two weeks or three weeks? Yeah, it will be adult? about yeah, it will be about three weeks. Uh, and uh, so uh, and a bee which is coming to let us say for cardamom flower, it almost its entire life it comes to the cardamom flower. And it comes to the same patch. So there is patch fidelity also. It comes to the same place and then it takes nectar, goes back, comes back to the same place. So like that, it uh, it acts. Yeah. So other than olfactory clues, they have any, I want to say, particular, how they can identify the, recognize the... the... One is, as I was telling, one is the color, color of the flower. So the color of the flower actually is the long distance cue. And olfactory cues are much closer when the, when the bee or the insect comes closer, it gets the olfactory cue and, and it is certain then it, it can land on those. And there are also, uh, in fact, in cardamom, there is another interesting thing that happens. A bee, once it visits a flower, it leaves some chemicals on the flower. So it is called as a footprint pheromone. Okay. So when another, when, when immediately after that, another bee comes to the same flower, it knows that there is no nectar. It is already harvested because the previous bee has left a uh, signal that I've already visited here. Um, so the, um, the, the second bee it will not land on the flower, it goes to the next flower. So like that, there is, there, there is an interesting behavior there. Thank you, sir. It was wonderful to listen to Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So tomorrow I'll be speaking on fossils. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sir. Dr. Ninad, can you unmute yourself? Dr. 
ਉਤਮ ਨਹੀਂ ਨਾ ਅੰਦਰ 